Uh, uh, first, we have Alex uh, representing the Project Pillow. Uh, Alex, would you like to say a few words? Hey, everyone. I am Alex Clark, creator of Python Pillow, president of A Clark Net, a open source software consulting firm, and president and executive director of DC Python, uh, serving the DC area's Python uh, event needs. And thanks for having me. Nice to meet all the other uh, participants and attendees. Thank you, Alex. Uh, next, we have Gina representing Octoprint. Yeah, hi, I'm Gina Heuske. The last name is probably a bit of a mouthful for most people here. Um, and uh, I'm the creator and main developer of uh, Octoprint, which is uh, which is the snappy web interface for 3D printers, and which is also, at least in the backend part, completely written in Python. Um, yeah, I've been working on this full time now for uh, seven years and six of those, I think, uh, five, five and a half of those fully crowdfunded. So I guess this is why I'm here today oh. uh, and uh, I'm, I'm yeah I'm glad to be here excellent wonderful thank you uh, next we have William from sage math hi um, so I started uh, sage math uh, in 2004 and funded it a lot via um, various methods and then I also started something called cocalc in 2013 so I've been very involved with two open source projects over the years Thank you, William. Yeah, uh, I used to be an academic, like a full professor, and now I'm a, now I run a company, a small company. So I transitioned from academia to industry. That's awesome. That's a story I've heard uh, somewhere else before. Well, maybe we'll talk about <laughs> that later. Um, I'd also like to introduce everyone to Eunice uh, from Open Teams. Um, hello, everyone. I am Eunice. I'm one of the co-founders and VP of Partners at Open Teams. Um, I was introduced to open source um, really through Open Teams. And Open Teams is an online marketplace to help connect uh, users and creators of open source through services and different products. Uh, I'll be happy to chat more about uh, what we're doing at Open Teams. Thank you, Thank Eunice. Thank you for having me. Uh, and next uh, and last, we have Sumana from Change Set Consulting. Hi, everybody. I'm Sumana Hariharishwara, and I have a small consultancy called Change Set Consulting, where I focus on, focus on short targeted help to open source projects. And so I started to learn how to write grant proposals and get corporate donations as well to uh, help fund open source software work for projects that I was working with. So I've put a few links in the chat. One is to a 10 minute talk that I gave at Pi Ohio last year on an intro to getting grant money for your project. Um, I'm also affiliated with the project funding working group and the packaging working group in the Python Software Foundation, both of which work on, on different aspects of trying to get funding for Python related projects, in particular, PyPI, PIP, and, and the Python packaging world. And I've, I've worked on that uh, some, and, and we can talk about that more. Also, uh, I just co-wrote a proposal to get some money from uh, a US federal agency, the National Science Foundation, for Python packaging security, which will be administered through New York University. Uh, so I have done a lot of writing, often successful grant proposals uh, to get money for open source projects. And I've also been working on getting money through corporate donations for important infrastructural projects inside and outside of Python, uh, for instance, with uh, projects like GNU AutoConf. And uh, my independent consultancy is based in New York City, which is where I am speaking to you from. Thank you, Sumana. Uh, really appreciate it. And I, I'm going to say again, I, I, I've just been really excited to meet everyone today. So um, I guess we'll, we'll jump right into it. Uh, the first question I had for the panel, uh, kind of focusing on the project maintainers to start is, what does funding success look like to you? You know, what, what does it mean to be have a successful funding of an open source project from where you stand? Uh, William, okay? do you have anything or, or Gina, anyone? Gina, go ahead. Yeah, uh, for me personally, I wouldn't focus so much on where the money comes from necessarily. So if it, if it, is, if it is an employment status or if it is a successful crowdfunding campaign or if it is, this depends or, or whatnot, but personally, I think a project is successfully funded when the people maintaining it can actually do this maintenance and still have a roof above their head 
uh, without having to do said maintenance during their after works hours at night uh, during weekends during vacations and all that but doing doing it actually as part of their work or even their full time work so having that option to to make it a part of your career or even make it your entire career exactly um let's see for me funding success is very relative to the open source or to the project itself so with Sage Math, the goal of the project is to create a viable alternative to Mathematica, um, Maple, and MATLAB in Python. And um, I guess funding success would be to have enough funding to be able to do that. And um, I think we're, and I'm sure that would involve, you know, at least 10 people being able to work full time on various aspects of the software. Really, um, we haven't got there yet, for sure. Uh, and with CoCalc, it's uh, different in that the goal is really to make it easy to teach using open source software via a web browser in classes collaboratively. And um, we, we could do a much better job in polishing the software and making everything available to users. And uh, it, one project's funded by grants and the other project's funded by people paying the company. And so um, the funding situation with CoCalc looks a lot better because it's balanced nicely. Like we have enough funding to support the users whereas the grant funded stuff is a little more difficult. Um, and then sustainability is certainly what you very much want with, um, feel like when, when the funding feels sustainable, it feels a lot better and more successful. To, so to me, sustainability is probably the most uh, important um, property of successful funding. Right, so kind of expand, expanding on that, that observation Gina made that it, it's not just about having that successful career, but that successful careers can be made out of it over the long yeah, term. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I would maybe also add that it should be stable because if I have to worry mm -hmm. every single month about mm -hmm. the next month, then I cannot really concentrate on doing my best job at maintaining or developing a piece of software. I, I constantly have to worry about whether I have said roof above my head next month as well. Right, and the more time you're spending, say selling or fundraising is time you're not spending writing code. Uh, Alex, did you have anything to, con to contribute on this one? There's two Alexes. Oh, Come yeah. yeah. Whichever Alex, both, one, the other. <laughs> I'll go first. Uh, yes, I've been asked this lo a lot and I thought about it a lot. And the answer is that I have already achieved what I consider to be a very significant level of success in that I get paid, my team gets paid, there's three other people besides me, and we've all been getting a paycheck for two years or something like that with Tidelift. And Tidelift uh, is responsible for this. And so I'm obviously a, uh, a huge fan of theirs. Um, I keep trying to get them to hire me full time. Uh, so, and that, that is the only thing I'll mention about success that, that is missing for me. And that is that I would love to do pillow or open source full-time. I, I currently have a company or two companies and I have a job at NIH. I don't want to do everything in the world. I want to do one thing and that's open source. So for success for me personally is that uh, for the project, you know, there, there's uh, be hard pressed to find, you know, I'm sure there's places to go, but uh, for the project uh, we're doing pretty good. Um, so thank you. Go ahead, Alex. I'll pass my word to Cinema. Thanks. Um, so I actually recently gave a talk uh, as part of the GitHub Office of the CTO speaker series on what would open source look like if it were healthy. And this is not just on the project level, right, but on the entire industry level. So I've just put a link in the chat and there's a transcript there for those of us who sometimes prefer transcripts to video, despite the fact that you're here in a video right now because people contain multitudes. Uh, but uh, I think that when you look at just sort of the industry as a whole, right, there's a massive imbalance in who does work and who gains profit. So part of what makes things sustainable is not just that individual laborers are making enough 
on a month to month basis to, you know, keep the wolf from the door. Um, there's also an emotional sustainability aspect to it, which is not feeling like you're being super exploited by the fact that big companies are making a tremendous amount of money off of your work and not reciprocating in a way that you find commensurate. So uh, that is uh, something that I think is, is not really on a project by project level so much as an entire industry wide level. Right. Um, but um, in terms of what success would look like, uh, which is you know, con connected to health and sustainability and those sorts of things, um, I think we need to think not just about the life cycle of a software development project, right? But the life cycles of individual people within them. Um, a healthy organism is one that has like new cells replacing old ones. A healthy ecosystem has, you know, life and birth and death in it and so on. So uh, part of what makes a project sustainable and successful is that um, resources can be employed and those include time and money and, and digital infrastructure and so on to help train up new apprentices to replace people who wanna pass that baton to somebody else. And this is in fact something that money can be brought to bear to do as we see part of that can happen through things like the Google Summer of Code and Outreachy internship programs um, to, to help bring people in as contributors. And then uh, one thing that I'm personally working on as well is uh, helping turn contributors into maintainers because I think that's a step that's often missing. And that's the place where funding can be brought to bear to help make projects healthier is turning contributors into maintainers. I like that you brought the that that kind of health and equity perspective to the discussion. I, you know, it's very timely. I don't know if folks have been watching on Twitter. There was a, a discussion that broke out about Babel JS. And, you know, Babel's very widely used for building up JavaScript packages. And while they are funded, they're not adequately funded and, and they're starting to run out of cash. And they went on Twitter to ask for money basically. Um, and there was a bit of a brouhaha that erupted around that. And so I, these issues of, of equity and health really ring true and it feels cyclical. Like every summer we have this discussion. So that, that's part of why I was so excited to, to be a part of this panel. Um, I think uh, one thing that stuck out to me while we were chatting was um, uh, this panel seems very diverse in its ways of having obtained funding and 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 how, how that funding is being applied. And so I wondered if we could explore that a little bit. and, and um, if the panelists could talk about how they've uh, pursued funding, how they've obtained funding, and um, you know, kind of go, just kind of describe their experience. I can start. So I um, started by getting a grant when I was an academic to fund number theory research, and then um, diverted it to funding conferences on development of Sage. Um, like one of the first people I invited was Fernando Perez. Um, and, you know, we did a lot of stuff and that, that worked. And then I got a number of other grants where I started to involve computation. These are mainly from the National Science Foundation involving pure math type stuff. Um, I just posted a link with all the grant proposals. And then uh, it worked pretty well for maybe, uh, I don't know, eight years. And then I think they caught on and then I suddenly stopped getting any grant I applied for. Um, so it worked really well for a while. Fortunately, a bunch of Europeans got really into the software um, Sage Math and uh, they were able to get some enormous grants um, from the EU, which funded a lot of work until about a, a year or two ago. Um, so for, for Sage, it's been lots and lots of grants from various people involved in the project and just the project getting critically large enough that we can distribute the attempts to get funding from various government agencies. And then um, my second way of getting funding for CoCalc was uh, angel investors in a small startup company first, um, and then followed by people paying for the product. And then we have a sustainable revenue source where we have you know, more money and recurring revenue per month than it takes to pay the three full-time people that work on the software. So, and you know, we're still, we're growing at a certain percent each year. So it's really the kind of two different models. Uh, my my uh, goal with starting the company in the first place was that it would become profitable enough that I could donate it or somehow fund stage development from the company later on, but we haven't quite got there yet. But we're getting close maybe, I cross my fingers. I really like that your story kind of 
straddles the two sides of this and you know, there's really multiple sides but that that nonprofit side and that for-profit mm -hmm. side uh, gives you a really unique perspective um thank you for sharing yeah the main surprise is how long each part of the story is i mean sage mouse started in 2004 and the company i started in 2015 as a separate company and it's, you know, it's six years ago and still very small compared to what i envisioned it would be like in six years so Sometimes the time frames, sometimes patience helps, I hope. We'll see. Awesome. Uh, let's see, for uh, Eunice, uh, could you maybe talk about how Open Teams uh, is, is trying to address the funding of open source projects? Yeah, definitely. I think Open Teams, and, and I just wanted to just mention a little bit on the success um, story um, that you mentioned earlier. I think for Open Teams, success looked like um, oh, having yeah. full time. Um, uh, contributors and maintainers of open source projects, either having successful businesses around the open source projects or actually getting full time careers um, out of, um, you know, just around the open source projects. And currently, the way Open Teams does that is by working with the users um, and a lot of the times large corporations uh, who use these open source softwares and um, working with them. Again, we, we definitely understand that there are a lot of opportunities out there from grants uh, to open core model, but one of the biggest models that has worked for us and um, our co-founder, Travis Olifan, which he started as a, you know, an, an, uh, I think an academia and became a businessman. Uh, one of the ways that he saw success for himself were by um, offering services and support um, around different open source projects. And that's one of the biggest way we help um, our founders get funding from these large companies. And we've seen a lot of success doing that um, in the past. So um, for us, it's really going to the big guys who are using these open source projects and figuring out how we can um, either offer them services or support around those open source projects. And we have different business models um, that we're using that definitely helps with the advancement of the actual open source project as well. I could elaborate more, but I wanted to make it, you know, short and sweet. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. Thank you, Eunice. Um, let's see. So to summarize for open teams, uh, it's about providing that marketplace to support um, kind of commercial endeavors. Uh, around open source projects that could be training, could be support, could be custom development, um, as well as perhaps other uh, product offerings. Uh, let's see, uh, Gina, would you like to, do you have anything to talk about funding of your experience funding the development of Octoprint or if there was funding? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So my, my path was probably a bit backwards from most people's. Um, so it, it all started as a pet project, like the usual stuff that you do during your off hours and stuff. And then it got big and I needed to find a way to keep this sustainable and healthy for me. So at this point, a large company that also happened to produce 3D printers approached me and basically told me, hey, we would like to fund you, like employ you full time, uh, pay your salary and you just do what you are already doing, but 100% of your time. And I was like, yeah, perfect. And then two years later, they ran out of money. And that was the point when I had to go the more normal way of trying to fund Octoprint's development through uh, yeah, a crowdfunding approach in that case. So in my case, a combination basically of uh, Patreon, PayPal, GitHub uh, sponsors, donor box, and, and yeah, the usual suspects. And to my ut utmost surprise, uh, that actually worked. Um, I cannot tell you how or why. <laughs> My only explanation is that I already had like a critical sized, critically sized user base that was convinced of the, yeah, of the product that I was offering basically, and of the of the software that I was offering enough that they were, yeah, were were open to putting their money where their mouth is as well, and that has worked so far, but it only has worked so far to fund me. So it, the funding is at no way the level where I could say, well, I'm now going to create a corporation and employ some more people to help me and all that. So also in Germany, everything like that is a, a bunch of red tape that makes everything extremely uh, difficult. Um, but at the very least, it has successfully funded one 
single open source full time maintainer maintainer in my in my person uh, for yeah since 2016 now so that is pretty awesome and amazing and sometimes i don't understand why but hey i'm taking it i'm happy that it works that's a wonderful story and i i, I think um Whenever I hear that that story of if I got hired full time to work on the open source project, I get a little nervous because I'm so familiar with the uh, that capture problem where people get hired and they get to work on it for a year, but then now the company has an employee, so they work on company projects, and now we've lost a critical maintainer. That is actually something they tried to do with me as well, but I always was like, hey, we, we had an agreement here, and what am I supposed to tell all the people that depend on my work, you know? And I also have to say, in hindsight, uh, I prefer the current mode more. It is way more stressful. It is way less um, secure, maybe. But on the other hand, I... I don't have this between chairs feeling anymore where on the one side I have an employee that uh, employ, employer that I have to report to and on the other mm -hmm. side I have I don't know how many thousand users and not necessarily they, they don't necessarily both want the same thing on the other yeah. side now I have 100,000 or something uh, employers so that is also maybe not the best but you know <laughs> uh, Gina, it can be a little bit stressful I have a question Gina what country are you uh, based in Germany Okay, so you I'm have like, healthcare, no matter what. Yeah, uh, more or less. So everything here is, I, I, have, I have a basic level of healthcare. So it's not like in the US where I, I would face, I don't know how many $100,000 of personal uh, um, invoicing uh, invoices when I need to get a tooth pulled or something like that. But um, on the other hand, they make it extremely difficult here for people to be self-employed with insurances that you are mandatory and tax laws that are extremely difficult to navigate through. So the first thing that I pretty much got when I went down this route was to get myself a tax consultant because without one, I, I, I was seeing myself in jail within the next two years, uh, simply because everything is so complicated, not because I wanted to do something wrong, but just because I feared. So no matter what I do now, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Uh, yeah. Also being, being self-employed in Germany and getting crowdfunding for work that you give away for free so people can take it, whether they pay you or not, is something that is completely foreign of a concept here. And there is like absolutely no precedence for that. So I'm currently also in the funding position that my local tax uh, people are like, I'm sure. At Princeton, like you're going to be the deciding case if it goes to court. I have if, a question. If push comes to shove, maybe yeah. <laughs> uh, does anyone know what is the country in the world that is actually most hospitable to this kind of a person? Is it Estonia? Maybe you know, in terms of making it really easy to be self-employed and to crowdfund income for something that is not a service you are selling. It's just something you're giving away, like. Does anyone have a sense about this? And the reason, of course, I bring it up, you know, Gina, you're, you have you, know, you, you have a basic level of healthcare. You're in Germany, is because so much of the time, I think I've seen that people who are thinking about you know, people who have just started thinking about funding and open source and sustainability and maintainers think, okay, well, you know, you turn on a spigot, and even if somebody just gets a certain amount of money per month that's let's say a quarter of what they need to live on, that'll still make a difference to them, right? It'll still be helpful. But at least in the United States, until that amount of money is at an amount where the person can feel okay about switching from a full-time employment job that comes with healthcare benefits to something else where they believe that on an ongoing basis, they'll be able to not only support their daily expenses, but also deal with healthcare. Uh, with buying health insurance, let's say on, on the open uh, government exchange, and that they believe they'll be able to do that for multiple years in the future when, when those prices are, are really volatile. Like there's a discontinuity where up until you get to that level of funding, it's really, really hard to actually have that amount of money change how much of this person's time is actually going to be available to work on open source. At least this is my understanding and my experience. I think if you were to survey people and say, you're a maintainer, where are you? Are you physically, for instance, are you in the US 
And do you, how do you get your health insurance? Is it through you being contract, you know, an employee someplace versus you being a dependent, a spouse, a veteran, you know, somebody who gets their health care through some means other than their employer that like those people who currently are full-time wage earners who get in the U.S. who get their health insurance through a full-time, what we call W-2 job with an employer, it's going to take a lot for those people to be able to switch to um, some kind of independent job. And so that's where if places like Open Teams, Tidelift, Patreon, GitHub sponsors, whatever the thing is, if they actually could start providing healthcare, health insurance, that would be a huge game changer, right? That, that, that leads- I agree with that. It leads kind of naturally into a question that I had wanted to ask today, um, which was what do you need your funders and, and it's a two-way question. What do the funders need the projects to know and the maintainers to know? And what, what do the projects need the funders to know about their situation and, and how things are made successful? And, and, and I, as an entrepreneur, um, I, I, I agree with what you're saying intensely, Samana, that uh, healthcare in the United States is one of our significant barriers. And then I heard from Gina that that's not as significant a barrier in Germany. It's more that uh, there's this uh, difficulty working under this new approach that it isn't well covered within the German um, tax system. Um, what are other things that, you know, as funders or as project maintainers, you, you need the other side of this funding equation to know? Uh, and I'll break in just to remind people orally, hey, there is a chat here in Zoom. Please feel free to put your audience questions for us there too. Absolutely. Damn, I just had something on the on the tip of my tongue, you know, it slipped past again. <laughs> well, I, I might poke at some folks, uh, uh, maybe a uh, Eunice, is, is there something you would like project maintainers or, uh, you know, project contributors to know? Yeah, I think um, the way, again, this is one business model that we think of at Open Teams. And I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, it's, for example, Gina, she said, you know, she's been able to raise enough money just to employ herself. Um, at Open Teams, and the way we, and the reason why we call ourselves teams is because we believe open source is built as a team and not as an individual. And we encourage, we want to help um, open source founders actually build businesses around open source projects, around their projects, if they're willing um, to offer some amount of services, you know, to the people who are, using the open source um, software. And um, open teams helps a lot on the business side. So if you're just an engineer and you don't understand how to start a business, grow revenue, you know, find sales, you know, you know, put the HR and actually get insurance from um, employers, um, open teams can help you do that. So um, that's one of the benefits uh, that we do offer at open teams because a lot of the people who build open teams were contributors in the past. And they understand that, you know, like how to start a business out of open source. And that's one of the things that, you know, we want um, any founder um, interested in actually building a long term career or a successful business around a project um, to reach out to us and we'll be happy to help. But Alex Clark or Alex Seguera or William, um, what, what would you like, uh, you know, if, if you're as a funder or as, as a fund? Uh, an entity that needs funding, uh, what would you like the other side to know? Actually, I wanted to tell my funding story answer before oh, I forget. Absolutely, it. And, please. Uh, it is that I was an open source consultant as of the mid 2000s. So I knew what getting money for stuff was. And I started Pillow in 2010 and did it myself for three years. And then in 2013, I asked the PSF uh, for money and they gave it to me. That was for Python 3, for uh, Pillow to support Python 3. And that's, that was the turning point for uh, widespread adoption. And then uh, I asked them for money again, uh, a few years later, I think, for the uh, domain that we use. But then in 2019, uh, Tidelift uh, a guy named Keenan Sulzik, I think, from Tidelift approached me uh, about funding. And so I wasn't actively looking for it at the time, but it was a welcome uh, 
uh, thing. And now I will think about that next question. I, I will say, you know, uh, for, in open teams, we've had the opportunity to speak with some of the folks at Tidelift and uh, it's been, it, I, I've been excited at the innovation we've seen in the industry in the past two years. And so it's great to meet someone who um, has a success story through Tidelift because, you know, uh, there's there's so much room in the industry for innovation and, and different ways of doing things. So I'll, we're just cheerleaders and really excited to hear about your success. Yeah, they they flew us up to Boston, my wife and I, and, and we met with them. And um, this was for, uh, uh, they brought all the you know, lifters together for an event and it was awesome. So uh, nothing but, you know, good things to say about them. That's cool. I've remembered in the meantime. Oh, go ahead. Um, well, so one thing that struck me when I was looking for ways to fund Octoprint and also some when, when the occasional sponsor broke away or something like that was a lot of the, yeah, let's say fundraising platforms that are explicitly targeting open source projects are, or at least it felt to me like that, are primarily targeting open source projects that are more like libraries, stuff that gets used by other developers stuff that gets used by companies in their development uh, uh, subdivisions and stuff like that. And I always felt a bit left out there as the maintainer of an end user facing piece of software that people like, like a grandpa, for example, who uses a 3D printer to print, I don't know, model planes or something. Uh, installs on their own. So th those are not people who necessarily navigate in these structures. They don't understand the concept of libraries. The, the companies that use my software might possibly, but then they are also, yeah, they will probably also not feel spoken to by the, the kind of language that is often used. So for example, I, I look primarily at Tidelift and I also think at Open Collective and all that was always focused at like, empower the projects that power you or something. And that was always, yeah, that, I, I mean, I do empower people with my software uh, and I don't say my, because I don't consider it like an open source property of everyone, but mostly just, it is primarily me who's working on that. Um, also because of the end user thing, because most of the people who use Octoprint cannot contribute back to it in code form. So the maintenance usually just lands on my shoulders. Um, where was I? <laughs> yeah, so, right. so those- it's about libraries. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, but... that, that, yeah. And that, that, that is just not me. So also I, I think also of, of, of projects like for example, GIMP or, or Blender who in, in, I mean, Blender is fully funded and, and does an amazing job there, but uh, still I, I think there, there is some room to grow there maybe for the for the funders or the fundraiser platforms to not only look at the at the libraries and that the building blocks that bigger end user facing or internal software is built from but also at that software as well that is shared under open source licenses right you're kind of um you know if, if we use these aren't the right terms but it's the difference between like a b2b business and a b2c business exactly. like your software exactly. is directly to the end user who may not be technical and exactly and, and, and often so isn't. Writing code. yeah i want to point out here there are some incredibly useful archetypes put out by open tech strategies a consulting firm that i sometimes do some work with in coordination with mozilla and i've just put a link in the chat uh these are uh, basically 10 basic categories of different kinds of open source projects, including, you know, libraries, uh, end user, things like VLC or Firefox, right, that end users use, um, things that are very much like, okay, there's a single business that really stewards this one project, like MongoDB, you know, or something like that. And then there's sort of the business to business consortium stuff. There's, and, and these different archetypes, the different categories of open source project, knowing which of these you're in helps you understand what are the forces at play for how many stakeholders are there? Who is going to care enough about this that they might actually be willing to pony up? Who do you kind of have to listen to? How will governance work? And things like that. It's really interesting, Gina, that you mentioned that it felt like a lot of the conversation was about libraries because I think part of what we're seeing there is a sort of pendulum swing where, uh, what was it, four years ago, it feels like, Nadia Eggball's report Roads and Bridges came out 
that got a lot of people's attention along with, you know, the heart bleed issue, the left pad issue and stuff like that on, oh no, like the infrastructure of our entire industry is much wobblier than we thought because of the libraries issue. And so the, the security, ah, we need to secure these things response, you know, focuses on stuff like that. And that's what you're seeing with uh, the new open source security foundation and stuff like that. And so that I feel was a pendulum swing away from, you look at like the age when things like, uh, you know, when Patreon started and when Kickstarter was being used, it was much more about applications and hardware that end users would be interested in, right? So that's like where a lot of funding attention went. So it's interesting to hear that maybe the pendulum swing of sort of our conversations about this has gone so far in this direction that it's actually made things harder for things like Octoprint. Um, and it would be good to have a more holistic conversation in, in the different spaces where that's appropriate uh, about the different archetype. Uh, just a quick just a quick note about Patreon. The problem with, with platforms like Patreon and, and Kickstarter, and especially Kickstarter, because it's like you, you fund one thing and then that's it. And if I continuously maintain something, that's it. Not that that's not something that I can just get money once and then I'm done. And with Patreon, when I started uh, back in 2016, at least back then, there wasn't even a category for software. So they they didn't really have this whole ecosystem or this this whole bunch of maintainers that might use this platform as 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 a platform as a funding platform for their projects on on their radar at all. I don't know if this has changed. I'm still listed in the writing uh, category for some reason. I never put myself in there, but hey, I mean, in some way, I am writing. Um, and yeah, so that that always made me feel a bit lost until stuff like GitHub sponsors came on the plan because. Patreon didn't really understand what I was doing and Tidelift and Open Collective or, and, and such, maybe they did understand what I was doing, but I was in the wrong target group. So that that is still a bit of a problem. As I said, GitHub sponsors fills this gap a bit, but it's always good to have more options. Oh, wow, that, that really, um, uh... We've had a really good discussion, though. I think, Alex, did you say you wanted, did you have something to, to, to say? So as I was sitting here, it came to me what my answer was to the question about uh, fun, what do funders need to know? And that is that uh, it's not a solved problem. So uh, Tidelift's uh, business uh, plan or uh, what do you call it? Their value proposition I find super compelling, which is in layman's terms to be the the Red Hat of open source software. So if Red Hat set up, you know, tech consulting and and had people install open source and then they supported it, that's where Tylift is headed with the software, not the operating system, but all the software. So they're selling, you know, uh, support for all of it. So and that's a huge thing to solve, and it's not solved. So funders, you know, compete with Tidelift. Uh, I think their business model is is a winner. There, there are two things if, if I can step in too and talk to this question. I, the first thing is that in the past two years, I think something has changed because this panel itself is the thing I want people to be aware of. Uh, there are several people here who have made careers out of contributing to open source software and under a variety of approaches, either through grant writing or through starting their own consultancies or uh, collecting money through different funding mechanisms like Patreon and, and GitHub sponsors. And, and I think that's really remarkable. And the thing to point out is that there are mentors out there for you if you're maintainers. Uh, on the funder side, it's to know that if, if you are looking to contribute funding, there are a variety of ways to engage with the broader community. And you know you just kind of have to think about what is the impact that you want to have? Um, and, and what is it that, that, that you, what value do you hope to derive from your funding? Um, and then just to kind of put a plug in for uh, Open Teams and Tidelift, there are companies out there that can help the maintainers. Uh, it, we, we have our own models, uh, but, but I think uh, there's this really big opportunity. Um, we like to think of Open Teams as like the Amazon dot com for open source. So, you know, if you've got a product around open source, we want to sell it. Uh, and we want to help you get, find your customers and get connected with them. You know, to Gina's point uh, about the, the episodic donation, you know, our, our, one of the models that we bring uh, on open team side is the notion of a subscription uh, for services, support, training, what have you, so that there are recurring revenue streams so that people can plan 
um, and it can have a reliable business built around their projects. If I may just hook into that, um, one thing that I always hear so often in, 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 when it comes to funding open source and what, what the people funding open source get back in return, there is always stuff like services, custom development, uh, consultancy, things like that. And what I am often also still lacking or missing in the discussion is the fact that they get on, ongoing maintenance. I mean, Yes. This is the main work that we do as the maintainers. I frankly, I would not even have the time anymore to do uh, some sort of side gig like providing some service or some custom solution. I, I have turned down uh, requests by companies who say, hey, we, we need a plugin for Octoprint that does this simply because I cannot justify spending this time on that when I know that I have these huge huge to-do lists on Octoprint and uh, get funding from, from people to do actually work on that. So what, what I'm trying to get at is that I, I think we, it would be great and, and, and all of open source and especially the open source maintainers would really profit from the fact that if people out there and especially companies out there would understand that the return that they get for funding open source is the return they already have. It's not something they get on top of that, I mean, may maybe something like placing a logo or something that is uh, somewhere yeah. that is stuff that is definitely not going to to rip an, an, an ho a hole in my schedule. But uh, all in all, it's Im important to understand that the stuff, the work that we are already doing, that needs to be funded too. It's not always the add-ons that we can also provide. And it's probably it's about risk mitigation. They're paying. It's like in paying an insurance policy. Go ahead, William. Yes. Sorry. I think I kind of came up with uh, an answer for at least stage math. Which I think is interesting just because it's it's uh, much different than the other projects that we're talking about. So Sage Math needs three things and they kind of come from different organizations. So one is um, we have GitHub uh, uh, sponsors donations and that helps pay for hosting. And we do need like a certain like a few hundred dollars a month for various hosting costs. And then a second thing, um, we have workshops a lot, maybe 10 per year. And um, those are pretty, they're very easy to fund in academia. There's just lots of resources available to run a workshop for about a week and get the funding for it. They're not cheap, but they, we've, um, we've had over a hundred so far. And so it's just probably very easy to do. And the third thing that we really need, but right, the project really needs is um, to take an, to be able to take roughly maybe 10 or 15 at once in various places, academics, and have them be able to focus on working on implementing some algorithm or class of algorithms for a semester. Um, so these are people who uh, have written a lot of research papers. They have a PhD, probably they're subject matter experts. And there are only a three, three or four people in the world that could implement this, out, this sort of algorithm. And you really wanna basically buy out their teaching for one semester and uh, do that a lot over the years and you know, have some sort of board set up that allocates the funding for that. And this third thing, um, I mean, it's barely happened at all. We've very occasionally had this happen, but it's, it's what we need maybe a hundred times as much as we've had so far. It's pretty expensive, but there, it's nice because um, you get the advantage of some extreme subject matter experts who are proven to have the right skills because they've already contributed something. And, um, uh, and there's also a lot of infrastructure in place already. You don't have to worry about their health insurance or where they're you know, like a lot of the extra overhead of hiring them is taken care of by their academic institute already, but you need money. And it's exactly the kind of money it's been very, very hard to find and frustrating to find. And sort of my goal is at least long-term is to, that there'll be a company that can provide money that funds this sort of work. But it's really these three different things. And we, we've had a big gap in the third, which is funding people, not like for their entire job being working on Sage. It's just that it's their job for one semester or one summer periodically. And um, it's extremely hard to find the money for it, unfortunately, for me at least. William, let's talk. Cool. Uh, we do have a question from the audience. Uh, let's see, the question is, as Gina says, paying for something you already have, why would they need to pay? Uh, so how can we show them that funding is the way to go else we'll drown and, and the software goes along with that? That is actually a good question. Um, in my case, I think I've made it quite clear to people that 
I am happy to work on this full time. I will do my best to keep moving it forward. But if I cannot do this as my full time job and actually live from it, then I will find a different job that pays my bills. And that means I will not work on this project anymore. And apparently that scared people. Or I don't know. But um, the point is really what Sumana already said that in, for, for, for most people, it's also a bit of insurance. They want this software to continue to improve. They want this software to continue to evolve. And a lot of the people uh, also know how to navigate a bug tracker enough to post and, and basically to swamp uh, the projects with feature requests. And how do they think the feature requests will get implemented on what time, right? Um, if you just wait for a, a pull request for a feature request that also needs to be merged, that usually also needs to be reviewed, uh, bugs have to be ironed out, uh, you get tech debt that needs to be taken care of, things like that. And especially if you primarily work with pull requests from various sources, uh, you get a lot of tech debt because of different ways of coding things and uh, people not knowing specifically what kind of side effects certain changes have and all that so this is basically yeah what they basically get is not necessarily just the code but they get the ongoing maintenance of the code and that is only insured is uh, that is only insured if you actually make sure the people the people doing that can continue to do that and that is something that a lot of people don't understand uh, but i at least i have made good experience with explaining this to people and telling them listen this is how things are. This is how things work. Uh, code doesn't grow on, on, on trees. Um, so the fact that you have that now in your hand means someone had to grow that code and that someone needs to eat too, you know? And yeah, if you, if you put it in, into, into, very, uh, in, 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 into very simple concepts, it seems to click with people even who have never touched any line of code before. So yeah. So this is a, I mean, this is a question of marketing and motivation. I'm really, really glad to get to hear Gina's uh, experience with this. Um, there's always going to be some quantity of humans who are utter, utter cheapskates and would prefer never to pay for anything that they can try to, that they can get for free. Okay, let's just set that aside as a given. Um, and then there are some quantity of humans who are extremely generous and altruistic and like funding other people. And even if you just put a donate button out and you don't do any clear marketing around it, some people are gonna click that and give you money. All right, fine. Let's talk about the middle, right? Which is people who do uh, respond to persuasion of some kind. Yeah, one of the things, uh, so Jeffrey just said in chat, it's like the same reason that you pay for Linux, but you can download it for free, certain kinds of convenience and uh, maybe wanting to put, you know, a little bit of insurance down that this thing that you is convenient to you is going to continue to exist in the future. I really have a lot of problems with Nadia Eggball's latest book, Working in Public. Uh, I wrote extremely many marginal comments about things that I disagreed with, especially in like the second half of the book. Anyone here who also read it, I'm happy to talk with you about it. But a thing that uh, she does get is, remember that for a lot of people, paying for a thing that you use that's made by individual humans is this relational thing uh, where the same way that, you know, a person might pay for uh, a ticket to go see a concert when there's, you know, they could listen to that music on streaming or on CD or something like that. Part of what they want is a little bit more of a personal connection with that artist. Um, or people want uh, the, the sense that, uh, that perhaps there is a chance they'll be noticed. Yeah, Alex, okay, yeah. Uh, I see that you also, you also have the book. Um, uh, Nadia Eggball went basically to work for, for GitHub where I'm assuming she was at least in some way related to the fact that GitHub sponsor started. She works in multiple places and now she works at Substack, right? Um, and so there's this, I think there's this through line in thinking about there are things like uh, library level infrastructure where the payment methods are probably going to be, there's gonna be a lot of government, uh, business and, and similar like large scale investment in libraries type stuff. And then when it comes to things where individual end users are making a thing that are, are, are using a thing, I'm going to guess there's going to be some more interest in people paying because they like having that personal connection with the creator, the artist who makes it. Right. There's also this, uh, we got to, uh, this is a marketing thing and, and humans like being connected to other humans in many cases. Uh, I can uh, agree. Uh, I can. I can totally uh, um, 
yeah mirror that or agree with that because that's also the experience that i've made so the getting this personal connection going and telling people, showing people who I am, reaching out to people, just, just being more present already does a lot of things in, in, in the funding department, basically, because if they can put a face to your, uh, to your work, then they are, yeah, there is this personal connection now. There is, there is no longer this, there's maybe one or 12 or 15 developers somewhere sitting in a dark basement, probably employed by a company or something. No, there's this one girl sitting over in Germany, uh, hacking away on Octoprint and then suddenly, ah, okay, maybe she could use some coffee money or something. Um, I do uh, want to mention something quickly since we're running out of time. Um, one of the things that Open Teams do, again, we don't just work with um, different maintainers that are interested in offering services. We actually work with maintainers that just want to maintain a project. And what we do is we communicate with the company. Maybe let's say one company is interested in seeing the project staying alive and moving it forward. We actually figure out what other companies might be interested in keeping this project alive and actually get into, okay, let's say we want to fund a two to four year, um, you know, lifetime of this project. And we will require maybe like 1 million to like, you know, sustain two developers to work on this project full time for the next two years. And we actually help the founders um, put those arguments together and help them fundraise um, for that. And again, our strategy is a little bit different because we don't go to individual people in the community. We actually target companies that are using the software. I just wanted to point that out. Oh, and uh, I'm always on the lookout for new product ideas. So I was, I was listening very carefully to your story, Gina. Um, so we, we, I would love to talk with you more, you know, uh, at some point. Uh, yeah. Well, Inesa, it's, it's uh, after five, I guess I should hand this back to you. But, um, but before I do, I, I really want to thank all the panelists. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you did. Um, and I hope the the crowd did as well.